the enemy gonna have dessert yet? Okay. Now, uh, what is Waikiki? Well, Waikiki is the district which today is bounded by the Alawai Canal. But back in the old days, it was not a clear distinction between where Oiliili started and Waikiki ended, or vice versa. And in the picture on the left, there, all uh, Waikiki as it originally appeared. Waikiki was a wetland. In fact, Waikiki means spouting fresh water. That's because these wetlands were supplied by streams that came down from the Koholau Mountains, as well as springs that came up out of the ground. And Hawaiians used Waikiki as a very fertile place to live, to grow kalo, and to use the ocean as a food source as well. But we also know that Waikiki today, as you can see in the pictures on the right, has gone from being a sort of a suburban area to being an entire, his, entire, his, an entire city of itself. So, now let's go to, as, as some of you may know, because as I said, Hawaii, uh, Waikiki was very important in traditional Hawaiian culture, there are a lot of associations with Ali'i or Ali'i families in the district of Waikiki. Here's the story of one of those important families. On the left is Archibald Claghorn, who came here from Scotland, and his wife, Princess Nikilike. Princess Nikilike was one of four siblings who included not only Prince Leleohoku, but also King David Kalakaua and Queen Kalani. She was married to Archibald Claghorn, and their child was Princess Kaiulani, who you see on the right. They lived at an estate called Ainahau, and in the middle of the picture you see a record label from 1929, and it's a song called Ainahau. So you can see that Ainahau was well known to Hawaiians. Now, Ainahau property was approximately 12 acres right in the middle of Waikiki, if you can imagine such a thing. And there were two main houses. The house that you can see in the background was the original house, probably from the 1870s. And closer to us is a separate, more modern, more ornate, and more grand house, probably from about 1890. In front of these two houses, on the left side of the picture, is a banyan tree. Banyan trees at the time were introduced in the 1800s. They come from India and uh, Southeast Asia. They were considered this wonderful, exotic, amazing thing. That's why there's a big banyan tree behind you, or next to Iolani Palace as well. So here is where Princess Iolani lived and grew up. Now. This whole family did not have a happy history because Princess Nikilike died, and then, as everybody knows, Princess Kaiulani only lived till her early 20s, and she died in 1899. Her Archibald Cleghorn lived until 1910 in the house on the Ainahau estate. It was his desire when he died he willed the Ainahau property to the city and county of Honolulu to become what he wanted to be called Kaiulani Park. What happened? The city and county of Honolulu said, oh, we, we won't take that. There's too much maintenance. So what happened? In 1917, the Ainahau property was subdivided and sold off as individual lots. And you see the ad on the right from the newspaper. Some of the people who voted not to take the gift of Ainahau were people who subsequently helped develop it. What do you suppose that's all about? Well, so, here's an aerial photograph on the left looking down on the general area of Ainahau in 1921. This is a very early aerial pictures. Aerial pictures did not get taken here until 1919. Ainahau, the Ainahau estate, or the homes that I just showed you, are a little bit outside of this picture. But to help place where you are, in the upper right corner you can see the Moana Hotel. So that's what we're looking down upon. And what happened to Ainahau is like what you see in the picture on the right and in the, regular, in the rest of this picture here. Lots of individual small lots with individual structures on them. That's the way Waikiki was developed. That's going to be something that's going to come up later on as I discuss this project further, as I discuss this further. So, well, so the estate is gone, but the house is still there. 
The house for a time was run as a hotel called the Idahoe Hotel. Here is a picture of it, and here is a brochure from that time period in the middle, uh, about 1915 onwards. In 1917, when all that property got sold off and subdivided, the hotel closed, the home was sold to a couple. The man was a film producer. He had hopes of doing some kind of film production locally. But in 1921, a water heater in the house overheated and it burned the house down. So now the estate is gone and now the house is gone. But the banyan tree is still there. And the banyan tree was turned over to the control of the Daughters of Hawaii, which is a group, as many of you know, and some of you are probably members of it, that is uh, in charge of Queen Emma's Summer Palace, which is called Hanaya Kamalama, in New Wana Valley, as well as Hulihei Palace in Kailua Kona. The Daughters of Hawaii placed a plaque on the tree. There is a close-up picture of the plaque. And you can see the plaque in the middle of the picture, down at the bottom. And it's acknowledging that this was where Princess Kaiulani sat, and she often sat with Robert Louis Stevenson, the writer and poet, and he wrote a little poem about her sitting under the tree and how he missed her. So, the tree is still there. But then what happens? The people living in the rental houses around the tree in 1949 say, we don't like this tree, it's so messy. It drops all these leaves and berries and stuff. So what happened? Cut down. So, now there's nothing left of I know at all. Some of you may know there is, however, a Kaiulani Avenue in Waikiki. And it is said, I have read, and I don't know how closely this is true, but the path or the, the route of Kaiulani Avenue is based on the original driveway of Ainahau to get to the main house. So the picture on the left, you can see what that driveway originally looked like. Lined with trees, beautiful shrubs, a very beautiful place. The picture on the right in 1940 is Kaiulani Avenue as it appeared at that time. Obviously, it doesn't look like that anymore. At the time that this picture was taken, Ray Jerome Baker, the photographer, said that it was, quote, it had been reduced to being a very mediocre street. Well, it doesn't look mediocre to us anymore because it actually looks quite nice with surrounded by trees, etc. Obviously, it's been widened any number of times today since uh, that picture was taken. So some people may be saying, well, what about the Princess Kaiulani Hotel? That must have something to do with her and Aina Ao. Isn't it built on the site of where the house was? And the answer is no, it's nowhere near where the house was. It's blocks away from where the house was. It happens to be, have been built on Kaiulani Avenue. That's the only connection. And in fact, I don't even think the site of the hotel is where, uh, is even on what was originally the Clayborn property at all. So it is nice that she's remembered, but as you can see, the connection to the actual place and the actual people is pretty tenuous. All right, continuing in the subject of hotels, the first big hotel in Waikiki, obviously the Moana Hotel. Not the first hotel in general, but the first big one. And it opened in 1901, and in the large picture, you can see what it looked like when it first opened. It is just a single wooden building very ornate, but it's entirely made of wood. In the center, at the very top, is the roof garden, and that, that little room is still there. And you can go up to the fifth floor and, and go into that little room. But the hotel was so successful that in 1917, 1918, they built two wings on either side of it. Those are concrete, and so they are not as is potentially damaged by fire because big wooden buildings like this, now, of course, there's sprinklers in there now since the 1930s. It's not going to burn down. But this was a big danger for big wooden hotels that they could be consumed entirely by fire. Also, in the front of, or on the ocean side of the Moana Hotel, was a famous pier. And it actually existed before the hotel had been built. And the pier extended out into the ocean, and that's a picture of it in the lower right, with a little roofed pergola at the end. 
and people could go out on the pier and watch surfers going by. And in fact, Beach Boys intentionally surfed past the pier so that people could look at them and take photos of them and take movies of them. And the pier gradually deteriorated to where it had to be demolished in 1930, so don't go looking for it now. What does remain, I've been talking about all kinds of things that are gone, but what does remain is the Banyan tree. And the Banyan tree has had a number of different dates ascribed to it as to when it was purportedly planted. And go back to the publicity material put out by the hotel, you'll encounter all these different dates. Uh, some including 1904, which is grotesquely obviously wrong because it was already there when the hotel opened in 1901. Well, I just read an article from a man who had grown up in a house that used to be located where this was, and he said it was implanted in 1896, so I'm going with that. The tree is still there. You can still sit under the tree at the Banyan Court. The picture of the, the Banyan Court on the left is from 1937. The tree is considerably bigger now, but it still looks very similar to this. On the right-hand side of that picture, you're going to wonder, what is all that big structure there? That's the original Moana Hotel dining room, which extended out over the sand on Highlands, and that was demolished in 1948. These are Moana Hotel guests in the early 1900s on the beach in front of the Moana Hotel. And I want you to look at what they are wearing. They are wearing shoes, they are wearing gloves, they are holding parasols, they are wearing elaborate hats. And that's to go sit, walk in the sand and sit in the sand, which is pretty crazy. However, it does show you that the Moana Hotel was doing quite well to attract fairly well to new people, even at that time. And just as an aside, this photograph has never been printed. Bishop Museum has the negative of this picture, but it's never been printed by anybody, reprinted anywhere, so no one's ever seen it. So you're seeing it for the first time. The other famous historic hotel of Waikiki, obviously, is the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And this is from a brochure from the middle of the 1930s showing you exactly where those two hotels are. The Moana Hotel was built separately by itself, uh, changed hands several times, and eventually was purchased by the Matson Navigation Company, which is very significant because they were the main supplier of tourists via their ships before World War II. And in fact, Matson is who developed the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. The land is owned by what was then called Bishop Estate and is now Kamehameha Schools. And in 1924, it was occupied by, partly by the Seaside Hotel, but by a variety of other buildings, and even a, a, some separate roads too. And the Bishop Estate put out a call for proposals to develop it into a luxury hotel. And the hotel it was specified had to cost at least $100,000. That meaning that it was gonna be really high end, because they wanted to maximize the income for, the, for running the schools. So in the picture on the top, you can see there's an aerial photograph. Matson obviously got the, got the job to do it. They, their proposal was accepted. There's the Royal Hawaiian Hotel under construction in 1925. And in the other corner, that's the Royal Hawaiian as it looked right about the time of its opening, which was February 1st, 1927. And you can see what a big building that was. That was a huge building for the Hawaiian Islands at the time that it was constructed. The Royal Hawaiian, as I said, was a very upscale hotel. It was very expensive for its time in the 1930s. The ins most inexpensive rooms were seven to nine dollars a night, which is unthinkable. But the suites, the Kamehameha Suite, which is on the ocean side, um, that went for as much as $40 a night, and that was a king's ransom at that point. In any case, it was very elegant, it was very upscale. You dressed up to go there, you dressed up to go to dinner. Um, yeah, we all know that it was a very upscale place. And music has always been associated with the Royal Hawaiian Hotel as well. And here are two different record labels from the 1920s and the 1930s of a famous song composed in honor of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in 1927 when it opened. 
by a Hawaiian woman named Mary Robbins who visited it and she wrote of how elegant it was and the, the plush carpets and how beautiful it is. She was sincerely praising how beautiful the hotel was. If you look at the performers of the Brunswick label record, you'll see that they are the Royal Hawaiian Girls Glee Club. That was an organization put together to not only sing as a glee club, but also for dancers. There were dancers as part of the glee club as well. They were the group, in fact, that not only uh, was commissioned to start a Kodak Kula show, but to run the Kodak Kula show for most of its existence. And here's some of the musicians who have performed at the Royal Hawaiian. Now, if we start down here in the lower corner, the three dancers are members of the Royal Hawaiian Girls Glee Club. Uh, Lily Patikin, um, uh, what you call Arnellis, and uh, Caroline Hubble. And the next man who is standing, some of you will remember Alfred Apaka. That's a very young Alfred Apaka in the 1930s. The Howley man on the end is Don McDermott Sr., who was a band leader as well as a songwriter and composer. So that's what was going on in the, among the things going on in the 30s. The upper picture, which is in color, is the Royal Hawaiian Serenaders. And they were performing at the hotel from 1947 onwards. Again, a little bit more casual, but still very elegant. And then on the right-hand side, by the 1970s, things had gone downhill. Um, <laughs> There's still musicians performing there, but this is obviously a polyester-clad group from the mainland who is playing disco music, and their name is Savvy. So the Royal Hawaiian did not retain its elegance for 100% of its lifetime. All right, now let's look at one of the natural features of Waikiki. I mentioned it was a wetland. I mentioned that there were springs. I mentioned that there was flowing water. Well, there were some streams that ran through Waikiki, and one of them was called Apua Kehau Stream. And this is Apua Kehau Stream right at the beach. Now, many of you are familiar with the concept that at the mouth of a stream here in Hawaii often will have a sand bank that builds up across the mouth of the stream most of the time. Behind that is a lagoon that's a mixture of fresh water and salt water. It's called a Mulibat. So this is the Mulibai of Apua Kehau Stream. In the background of the top picture, you can see the sand spit going across the mouth of the stream. And these two pictures, the one on the top is from the early 1900s. The other one is a group of bathers next to Apua Kehau Stream in 1890. So you can see how beautifully vegetated it is. Well, by the, 19, uh, by, the 19, uh, by the early 1900s, obviously the banks of the Apua Kehau Stream changed when the Moana Hotel was built on the Diamond Head side of the stream. Here are two pictures showing that. Uh, the bottom picture, obviously, the moon dive with a canoe in it. And the top picture, kind of astonishing to see the side of the Moana Hotel, which many of us are, have seen, with a stream right next to it, but there it is. And so how did that work with Kalakaua Avenue? Well, Kalakaua Avenue went on a bridge over Apua Kehau Stream. Here are two pictures of that bridge. The picture on the top, you can just see the railing of the bridge on the left-hand side, just to the left of the parked car. And in the bottom picture, we're looking from the side of the Moana Hotel at back at Kalakaua Avenue, going over Apua Kehau Stream. Well, okay, what happened to it? Why isn't it there anymore? Well, this is what happened to it. The construction of the Alawai Canal, which went, which began in 1920, and gradually the dredge that you see in these pictures ate away with its shovel the coral substructure that was there in Waikiki, which is what Waikiki pretty much was, ancient coral reefs. So it would chew this up to create this canal. The canal intercepted the streams as they came down from the Kokolau Mountains, so all of that water then would go out through the mouth of the Alawai Canal and not continue down to where the beach was. 
And also, as all of this coral got chewed up, it would be directed through big movable pipes to be spewed out and to fill all of those wet areas to bring the level up so that it was then dry land. And this is what happened to a Kauake House stream. This is a photograph in the early 1920s of the stream actually being filled by all that coral, all those coral chunks with water being pumped out of that big pipe that you can see there. And in the background, you can see the top of the Moana Hotel. So you can see that that's where we are. That's what happened to our Boa Dot Stream, as well as all the rest of what we see. So there you have the comparison of what had been and what it ended up being. On the left, this, what had been very productive in terms of food production for first Hawaiians who grew kalo, and then for Japanese and Chinese who grew rice and who raised ducks. And in fact, these were frequently referred to as duck ponds because there were so many ducks which were providing eggs as well as ducks to eat. And on the right hand side, there is the landfill, the coral chunks that I just described. And underneath that picture, it's hard to see, but handwritten, it says, Waikiki Reclaimed Land. Now, on the banks of Apua Kehau Street, something very auspicious happened in 1908. Who knows what that was? It was the creation of the Outrigger Canoe Club. And there it is, the original Outrigger Canoe Club, as it looked when it was first started. And you can see a little bit of Apua Kehau Street cutting through the sand at the bottom of the picture. Uh, these were the first structures that were used by the club. The club was started to perpetuate surfing, but it, there was also a lot of there was also a lot of other reasons for that. But we won't go into that right now because they don't have time. But basically, it was the idea was perpetuate surfing, perpetuate canoes, perpetuate uh, canoe paddling as well as canoe surfing. So things gradually changed. They changed rather rapidly. Those those uh, polypili or grass houses were completely inadequate for the use of the people. So the members gradually got these other structures. You can see at the top there was a big hale that was uh, potentially used, I think they used it for different things, but in addition to that, I think they uh, stored uh, canoes there. But at the bottom right is the main building of the operator for many years, which was one big open so-called dance floor on the second level, and then underneath, canoes were stored. And again, the a Kauake House stream is still flowing right there. And if you had joined the Outbreaker Canoe Club in 1917, as Paul W. Rushford did in August, on August 24th, 1917, you would have gotten this card after you had paid your fee of $20. <laughs> and I guess it's not the same now, is it? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it's gone up a little bit. In five years since then. Um, but Paul Rushford got locker number 91 as well, if he wanted to go use his locker. Um, moving up to the 1930s, something interesting happened. There, there's always been a connection, or there was during this time, a connection between the African Canoe Club and the Madison Navigation Company, which, as I said, not only owned the Hawaiian Hotel, but had constructed the Royal Hawaiian Hotel on either, essentially, the, on either side of where the club was. And in the early 1930s, the Hawaiian Hotel Company approached Upper Canoe to say, the Upper Canoe Club to say, we would like you to create an, a Beach Boys organization to make it more reputable. And so created was the Waikiki Beach Patrol. On the right hand side is a booklet that was placed in all the hotel rooms at the Royal Hawaiian and the Moana, listing what the workers of the Waikiki Beach Patrol would provide to customers at the cost. So there was no dickering and there was no, let's see, I'm gonna charge you $5, I'm gonna charge you $10. It's all very legitimate. Um, there were some other background reasons for why this organization was created, but that is way more than I can get into right now. I will just mention the Massey case for everybody who knows what that is. 
The Waikiki Beach Patrol, here are the members of the Beach Patrol. They all wore the same outfits and you can identify them. They all have the same trunks and they all have the same tank tops with the logo on it. And they operated out of a little, a little house, a little brass house, not brass house, a little crude structure on the beach right next to the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which is where you would go to arrange your, uh, your swimming lesson, your surfing lesson, your canoe ride, your bomi bomi, etc. So in the 1930s, the club was still using that 1910 building that I showed you earlier. This is a picture from 1935. Uh, supposedly it had been moved back from the beach, so it wasn't so close to the beach at that point. But the club faced a real dilemma in the 30s because the lease was going to end. And the lease was with the Queen Emma estate, which owned the property. And because it was going to be financially impossible for the club to pay the lease rent as it was going up, a deal was worked out again with the Hawaiian Hotel Company to do something different with the property and to allow the club to stay there. And what happened was the Hawaiian Hotel Company took over the lease, paid the lease, for to Queen Emma Foundation. They divided the property into two pieces. And on the front part, they subleased it to what became a retail building called the Outrigger Arcade. So this is the Outrigger Arcade facing onto Kalakau Avenue. And you can see there's the Moana Hotel, so you can figure out where you are. And the overall layout of the property was this. This is a picture from 1957, looking down from the Princess Kaiulani Hotel. You can see the Outrigger Arcade takes up about half of the property. It's, it's considerable. And it's U-shaped, faces onto Kalakaua that you can see at the bottom of the picture. To get to the Outrigger Canoe Club on the Makai side, you walk through an open passageway in the Outrigger Arcade building to get out to the club proper. And when you walk through that passageway, this is what you would have come to. This is the main entrance of the club. And as you can see, it's got this beautiful, ornate, uh, pointy crest above the door. Underneath that, a little sign very tactfully says, members and guests only, all you tourists who wanted to get out of here. And you would walk through this building, and you would come to an open space in which there was lawn as well as a big uh, sand beach volleyball court. So this is the building, this is the other side of the building I just showed you. You would walk through here, and then you would get to the club proper, which was right on the beach. So all of this development uh, got started in 1938 and it opened in 1941. This was the first time the Outrigger had a full-on dining room and bar located in that blue building with a striped awning. And on the beach side, of course, there were still the places where you could go for your fun on the sand and the surf. This is also where the canoes were kept. So the canoes were carried over this stretch of sand to and from the ocean. And then they were stored underneath this building, the blue building, and upstairs on the second floor was the dining room. And as you can see, there were a lot of canoes at that time. And of course, the Outrigger had been supporting and nurturing canoe paddling during all this time period. So canoe paddling today is a very big thing. One of the reasons it survived was because the Outrigger was continuing to do it and in fact was having canoe paddling competitions. So what happened to that building? Well, guess what? The lease ran out yet again. And the lease was going to come up for renewal and or to end in 1963. So throughout the 1950s, there was a lot of debate what is going to happen to the operator. We cannot possibly stay here because starting in the 50s and then happening much more in the 60s, Waikiki was exploding in development. It was not feasible to have one private club right in the middle of all of that. So you can see on the left, there's the building I just described to you, and on the right is what replaced it. And what replaced it was this, the Outrigger Hotel. Many of you will remember Roy Kelly and the hotels that he created and ran. And those hotels started 
being very low budget, and gradually he, he got up to some more expensive hotels. But he is the person who built this hotel. His entire chain of hotels then became the Outrigger Hotels. And at one point, probably in the 1990s, there were something like 20 different hotels in Waikiki that were all called Outrigger or something. Um, the reason that whole corporation was called Outrigger was because he built this hotel on the site of what had been the Outrigger Canoe Club. Well then, okay, that's where OCC used to be. What about where we are right now? What, what used to be here? Well, this used to be on this property. This is an immense mansion that was built by a man named James Bicknell Castle in 1899 and 1900. The name of this mansion was Kainalu. And you would think, well, he must have had a really big family to have such a huge mansion. And in fact, no, he only had one son. And in this picture, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see two children wearing big hats. Well, one of them, in white, is Harold Castle, the son. And next to him is his friend from next door, Alice Heeman, who he eventually married, and who had, who, who had three children. And they, as young marrieds, also lived in this house, which was huge and empty and unpopulated because there was hardly anybody to live in. And if you look at the top of Kainalu, you will see on the top, on the roof, there is a little structure there with a striped on it. And if you had gone up to the top of that roof and looked out, this is the view that you would have seen. And the thing that is most amazing to me is how close and large punch hole looks. Because it looks like it's right there. It's because there's nothing in between it and you to give you a sense of how far away it is. Of course, now you can't even see it. But it does look very, very different. The other thing is to see where the pier is, and there's a structure on top of the pier. If you go directly up from that to the shoreline, that's right about where the outrigger was originally. So you can see that's the former place, and here we are right now. Why did the outrigger move? How did that happen? Well, the, amazingly enough, the Castle family only owned Kainalu for about for 20 years. And then they sold it to the Elks. So it became the Elks Club. And in 1954, the Elks Club came to OCC and said, would you guys consider leasing part of our property? And it took years and years to figure it out, but they finally did. And where we are right this minute was completed and opened in January of 1964 on part of what had originally built, been the property of Kainalu. And the, the house was demolished in 1959. So again, we don't look over there and see it. It's long gone. If it was not for Kainalu, I might not exist. How could that be, you ask? Well, here are two ladies sitting in front of Kainalu. The woman on the left is Mrs. J.B. Castle. Her name had been Julia White, and she was from Massachusetts. And then her sister, Nellie, who was the other lady, came out and lived here because she was considered an old maid because she wasn't married. She did, however, meet a man here and marry him, so that made her more legitimate. But her, Julia, and Nellie's niece was also named Julia. She was named after her aunt. She was my grandmother. My grandmother came out to visit her two aunts and her uncle and stay at Kainalu. And on one of her visits, she met my grandfather and decided she wanted to marry him. And she went back home to Massachusetts and said, I want to marry this man. And her parents said, absolutely not. You are not going to marry a man who's half Hawaiian. And they sent her on a lengthy trip to Europe and Egypt. So she would forget about him. And it didn't work. And knowing my grandmother, that just made her far more intense in her desire to be married to this man. So they did get married, and they had three kids. And one of them was my father, so that's why I'm Hooray! Thank you, my mom. Okay, let's go back to the original site of the Operator Canoe Club that I was showing you earlier. Let's look across the street 
And around the time that the Outrigger was still a very new little club, this is what you would have seen across the street, directly across the street. This is the Seaside Hotel. And that is the main building of the Seaside Hotel on the right. And if you look behind that parked automobile, you can see two other structures. The Seaside Hotel actually also occupied part of the property across the street that I mentioned earlier, the Canyon Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And then if you look on the far side of this picture, you'll see the fence around a tennis court in the middle of their beautiful lawn. So originally, this was what was across the street. And uh, this also was purchased by the Hawaiian Hotels Company, so that Matson ended up owning it as well. And if we go forward in time to 1947, 1948, this is what was across the street. That building of the Seaside Hotel that I just showed you is still present. It's on the right-hand side of this picture, so you don't see it. This is the original uh, Don the Beach Homework restaurant and curio store. So the building closest to us is the curio store. And if you look carefully, you can see it's got palm trees growing up through it. Don the Beach Homework was a fascinating man who's, again, I cannot tell you all the stories because I don't have enough time. But he came here in 1947 to open a South Seas restaurant because he already had one in Los Angeles and was very successful. And Don the Beach Homer and Trader Vic were both competitors creating the same Polynesian fantasy with exotic cocktails, etc. They both did it in Los Angeles. And then they both came out here and opened restaurants here too. I always thought, well, they must have originated here. No, 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 no. In any case, this was the Don the Beach Homer restaurant, or complex, really. And he only got a nine-year lease. So it was going to expire in 1956. Then what was he going to do? Well, he teamed up with two rich investors from the mainland, and they created the international marketplace on this same site. So directly across the street from the Outbreaker Arcade that I showed you was originally this, which opened in 1957. This is the way it looked for many of its years. It was open, it had, it was like a little mini Disneyland, essentially. Don the Beachcomber thought that everybody who came out here should have an exotic experience. So he put together this sort of pan-Polynesian architecture with touches of Asia, and a lot of different stuff from different places, and people loved it, and it was hugely successful for tourists. The Banyan tree was already on the grounds at the time. The Banyan tree, as you can see in the upper right, had a tree house built into it to make it even more exotic. Lots of tiki carvings, etc., throughout the place. Um, again, very successful. It gradually got absolutely packed with stuff over the time period that it existed. Uh, not only lots of buildings, but lots of kiosks. A tremendous amount of trash was for sale, but people loved it. Uh, it was demolished in 2013, and in 2017, the current version of the International Marketplace opened. If you had walked to the back of the original International Marketplace, you would have come to what was originally the Donna Beach Homer's Night Club. But in 1961, Don sold the nightclub to a Hui that he also had as a member Duke Kahanamoku. And it became Duke Kahanamoku's Supper Club. And in the picture on the right, you see Don the Beachcomber shaking hands with Duke to say, congratulations on taking on your new wonderful nightclub. Well, the nightclub was okay. It didn't do tremendous business until 1964, when Don Ho settled in there, and then for the next possibly five years or so, it was the absolute hottest place in town. This is when Don Ho first really took off in popularity. It's when he reached his peak of popularity. It's when he recorded Tiny Bubbles. He became an international star. And so lots and lots of tourists wanted to go see him live at Duke Mahanamoku, so the club thrived during that time period. How many people know that in addition to having a nightclub, Duke Honorable used to run gas stations? A few of you did, two people back there did. 1933, 1934, Duke Honorable ran two Union Oil gas stations, one in Uwanu and the other one right in the heart of Waikiki, and that's the picture. Those are the pictures that you see right there. 
he dropped this particular business when he was elected sheriff of the city of Kambi in 1934. So he only did it for a short period of time. And the gas station was located on the corner of Seaside Avenue and Palakau Avenue, where the Waikiki Business Plaza is today. And some of you maybe know where the H&M store is. That's exactly where this gas station was. Well, Waikiki, as I just said, uh, Don, Don Ho was a major star, but there were also innumerable performers. I've already touched on this a little bit. And the level of entertainment that was provided ranged a great deal. At the top end were the shows at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, and that's what you see in this picture here in the Monarch Room in the early 1960s, elegant dining, you had to dress up, and a very high quality show. But on the other end of the spectrum, there was the Orchid Room in the 1950s. Oh, somebody, oh, Jerry, you know the Orchid Room, man. Across the street from my office. Across the street, or you could just pop right in from your from that office. Yes. Okay. That's the looked at the building. That was across the street. Well, Jerry, obviously I can't tell you anything about the Orchid Room, but uh, I can tell you that there were strippers, as you can see. And um, my mother got taken there, my parents went there with another couple in the 1950s, and my mother was so offended, she got up and walked out. And then the other three had to come and join her and go home, so. But Jerry, you were a regular? I never went there. You never went there, she says, okay, we'll go with them. <laughs> I used to see the girls come and go. Oh, I bet you did. <laughs> oh, anyway. They didn't look like that when they were on the street, though, did they? No. Uh, but Waikiki also was a place where we went to the movies a lot. And a lot of us in this room will remember going to the movies in Waikiki. The first movie theater in Waikiki was the Waikiki. That's the one that you see on the left. Opened in 1936, the premier, most elegant movie theater in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, everybody who went there will remember the interior looked like you were outdoors in a tropical garden. There were two fake palm trees on the other side of the street that looked very real. And when the lights went down for the movie to start, there were projectors that showed moving clouds on the ceiling, so it looked like you were outside in the moonlight. And when I was about five years old, that just astonished me and I couldn't figure out how to do it. And to this day, I don't know. Um, also, the second theater, the Kuhio Theater, opened in 1945. That's on the upper right, filled with neon, beautiful neon exterior, beautiful marquee, a really, a really elegant theater. Um, and then at the bottom right, the Royal Theater opened in 1964 on Kuhio Avenue, and that also was a, a first-run, elegant-looking place. It's hard to believe, but in the 1970s, there were nine functioning movie screens in Waikiki. So we went to a lot of movies, and they're all there. Less tawdry than the Orchid Room, um, we have also the Honolulu Zoo. Started in the early 1900s and gradually grew to be a good deal more um, impressive than it was originally when it mostly had birds. But as you can see in the 1940s, if you went up to the zebra cage, you were cautioned not to pet the zebra because she sometimes bites. It is astonishing for me to think that you could actually get close enough to touch one of the animals in the zoo. Um, the building at the top is the entrance to the zoo. It was built in the early 60s, designed by a well-known local architect, Alfred Price. He is best known for designing the Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor. That building is still there, although it's been completely dismantled and it looks terrible and has been in a state of disrepair for some time as it is being restored, but it's not going to be destroyed, fortunately. Then there's also the Waikiki Aquarium, which opened in the early 1900s, and it was rapidly, rapidly became part of the University of Hawaii system, so it has a scientific purpose. On the left-hand side is the original aquarium building, on the right-hand side is the current aquarium building, which was opened in 1955, which makes it pretty old by right now. It's almost as old as I am. It's pretty old. How many people know what organization started the Waikiki Aquarium? Nobody knows. That. Because it was the Honolulu Rapid Transit Company. 
And why did they do that? Well, in 1903, the HRT streetcars were extended into Waikiki along Kalakaua Avenue, and the streetcar ended, terminated, right next to Kopiolani Park. And in order to give people a reason to ride the streetcar to the end of the line, HRT built the aquarium as an attraction for people to do that. So there is one of those early streetcars, open streetcars from 1903, and then in the bottom, that's the termination, that's the terminus point of the streetcars as it was for a great many years, till 1941. And the HRT is actually really important in the development of Waikiki because, as I will be talking about in a minute, Waikiki became a suburban area from the 1920s onwards, and not everybody had a car, so they relied on transit to get them to and from places. And originally, as I said, it was the streetcar that ran down the middle of Kalakaua Avenue. In 1937, the streetcars were eliminated in favor of these electric buses. That's a Kali trolley bus, and there it is on Kalakaua Avenue, and you can see the streetcar tracks in the middle of the street, and in the distance on the right is one of the streetcars. The streetcars went out of use in 1941, and after that we had electric buses until 1957, and then we had regular diesel buses until 1971 when the city and county of Honolulu bought the Honolulu Rapid Transit Company, and the bus system became part of the city government. Well, the streetcar tracks, they didn't need them anymore. And they would have taken them out pretty quickly after they stopped using them, except World War II got started, and it wasn't possible to do that work. So it had to wait till 1946. So here is the crew yanking those metal streetcar tracks out of Kalakaua Avenue because they're no longer necessary in 1946. And none of this is going to look familiar to you, but you do see Diamond Head in the distance, so you do know that I'm telling you the truth when I say it's Kalakaua Avenue. So as I said, Waikiki rapidly became a suburban area. It was intended, as, I, as you saw earlier, it was composed of numerous small lots that were like the size of private home lots in many cases. People did build private homes, but there also were a lot of rentals, there also were rooming houses and small hotels. So from the early time forward, there were a lot of transient people, but they lived in structures like the ones that you see here. And even into the 1950s and 60s, a lot of Waikiki still looked like this. The streets were lined with trees, palm trees, all of the structures were low rise. They were one and two story. And the streets were narrow because the streets were intended to just be used for all of these individual houses. And along the LOI, again, gradually all the empty lots were filled in, certainly by the end of World War II. And this is what it looked like. If you looked from the Macaulay Street Bridge down the LOI towards Diamond Head, it's all just one and two story buildings like the one that you see at the top. And these two pictures are from 1952. And then gradually, as I said, in the 1950s and 60s, there gradually began to be more tall buildings. Well, Waikiki had never been developed with the idea of turning into a densely populated urban area with lots of high rise buildings. So this is why, for one thing, traffic has always been a problem because the streets, except for Kalakaua, and Alwai Boulevard, which were laid out as big wide streets, all of our other little neighborhood streets like this suddenly had to start fulfilling the needs of innumerable more people than they were designed for. This is an aerial photograph from 1955, and this is the beginning of Waikiki's boom. Although it's not much of a boom yet, but at the time it was a big deal. So all these numbered hotels, one is the Biltmore Hotel, where Jerry used to work, Two is the Surf Rider, which is connected to the Moana Hotel, which is number three. Number four is the Princess Kaiulani, which I showed you earlier. It opened in 1955 also. Uh, and number, that's number four. Number five is the Royal Hawaiian. Number six is the Holy Kulani. Number seven is the Reef. And number eight is the Edgewater. The Reef and Edgewater were the first hotels, or the second and third hotels, developed and built by Roy Kelly, who then subsequently built the Outrigger. Okay, 
So this was considered astonishingly you know, out of control development in 1955. But something not on that map is another hotel, which you also know, uh, which is the Hawaiian Village. It also opened in 1955. It also has a fascinating story connected to the man who developed it, Henry J. Kaiser, incredibly wealthy industrialist. He supposedly came here on vacation with his wife in the early 50s. They were in a suite at the Royal Hawaiian. They loved it. They wanted to stay here longer. And the Royal Hawaiian said, sorry, we, your suite is already booked. You have to leave. He said, well, that means this place is doing well economically, so I'm going to build a hotel. And he did. It was the Hawaiian Village. The Hawaiian Village is still there today. The Hilton Hawaiian Village it now is. And it started very small, but it grew astonishingly fast in, in five years. It was constantly something new was being built. Henry Kaiser wanted everything built immediately. And so he'd say, OK, X number of months from now, this building is going to exist. And so this is what happened. This complex grew very quickly. He also, because he was so wealthy and powerful, was able to build this dredge, this lagoon, in front of the hotel where it had just been sort of hard flats and not swimmable. And then build a whole beach on the outside of the lagoon, which you could never do today. Um, and it was also a place of modern architecture. It was from the 50s, so 1955 to 1960. These very dramatic mid-century, what we now call mid-century architectural things were being built. So on the top is the famous Kaiser Aluminum Dome, because Henry Kaiser also owned Kaiser Aluminum. The dome was constructed as a showpiece of, this is how we're all going to live in the future. We were all going to live in geodesic domes designed by Buckminster Fuller. And this, this was constructed within 36 hours. All of the panels were prefabricated at a factory, shipped here, and then assembled into the dome. It was considered an absolute marvel of modern engineering. Lower left, that is the long house meeting room. That's the first hotel to have a meeting room available for public use. No hotels had them here before that. So this immediately became where all kinds of different events were held, and then a, a massive hotels had to quickly recoup and build their own meeting house. And finally on the right, there is a corner of the uh, original lobby of the Royal Home, I mean of the, uh, that thing that I'm talking about. And um, <laughs> it again is very 50s, very, very 50s. Unfortunately, all of these are long gone because of course it's been redeveloped, which is too bad because they were quite distinguished. Okay, who remembers pink jeeps? Yay, some people remember pink jeeps. Pink jeeps were absolutely, they were all over the place for a time. And they are connected to Henry Kaiser and the Hawaiian Village Hotel. The Kaiser Corporation also bought the Willis Manufacturing Company that made Jeeps. And in 1959, they came up with what they called the Jeep Gala model. And Jeep Galas were painted either blue, green, or pink. But we, the pink ones were the ones that we almost always saw here. And we all knew that they were associated with Kaiser because pink was his favorite color. So when he was developing Hawaii Pie, all of the construction equipment, the bulldozers, trucks, and everything were all painted pink. So we saw a pink Jeep and said, oh yeah, Kaiser. Well, Jeeps are not really made to be vacation vehicles, but these were really successful for a warm weather destination because people said, hey, I'm on vacation, I'll drive a Jeep with the with a fringe on top, with a striped roof. Keeping in mind, however, there's absolutely no safety equipment. There aren't any doors. And there's absolutely no security. You walk away from your Jeep and leave something in the Jeep, people can take it. These are thoughts that we have today. Now, traffic. I mentioned traffic earlier. Traffic has been a major source of concern in Waikiki throughout this history that we're talking about. In 1952, parking meters were installed along Kalakaua Avenue for the first time. And as you can see, the company that made the park o meters was advertising proudly that they had been installed in Waikiki. Parking meters don't exist to earn money. Parking meters exist 
to make people move their cars. That's why you can't, so you don't park your car and leave it there all day. This is one of the reasons, one of the ways to try to control parking in an area that was increasingly uh, desirable for people to go to. Who remembers pedicabs? Yes, some of us remember pedicabs. Pedicabs started in Waikiki in 1973, and within several years there were hundreds of them. And they were considered to be a lot of fun by tourists, but for everybody who had to drive through Waikiki, they were considered an impediment to traffic. And the pedicab drivers, many of them didn't actually work for the company that owned the pedicab, they just rented it. So they were working entirely on their own, and they became notorious for being, first of all, cooks who grossly took advantage of Japanese tourists to horribly overcharge them, and two, for selling drugs and to guiding people to sex workers. So they were legislated out of existence in 1988, but had you been here in the 70s and 80s, you would have seen zillions of these things. So again, traffic. Traffic became a major concern in Waikiki by the early 1950s. People were trying to think of solutions like, should we reroute Kalakaua Avenue? Should we make it, I mean, what, what can we do about this? And not only was the congestion aggravating, but it was also dangerous. People got hit by cars. People still get hit by cars, in large part because they're on vacation and they're not thinking clearly about, oh, a car could run me over, I just want to cross the street. So this was a major concern it also coincided with Waikiki becoming increasingly tawdry. And so with lots of traffic and a lot of cheesy signs and a lot of discombobulated stuff, people again were saying, if we don't clean this up, people are going to not want to come here anymore. Well, they dealt with the traffic problem by making Alawai Boulevard and Kalakaua Avenue one way in 1971. And that was a huge success. Because not only did it make traffic move a lot faster, it reduced traffic to the point that it was possible in later years to actually make Kalakaua Avenue narrower and the sidewalks bigger. So today, at the Diamond Head and of Kalakaua Avenue, we lost two lanes at least to increased sidewalk space because this traffic pattern was successful. And as I said, there was this sleazy period, which a lot of which we lost again because of major government uh, investment in cleaning up Waikiki. But as you can see in these pictures, things got pretty messy looking. The picture at the top of Mayor Fossey and Joyce Fossey riding in the open Mercedes in a parade looks really nice, but for those who can't see it, the sign above their head for the Lollipop Lounge says, the Lollipop probably presents topless amateur night. Every Wednesday, cash prizes. Okay, is that what you want to be projecting for your resort area? Not necessarily. The picture in the lower part, the lower corner, not only is there a sign for a massage studio, quote unquote, but in the lower right corner, it's difficult to read and most of you can't read it anyway, it's in Japanese, and it says, porn merchandise. <laughs> Hardcore pornography was aggressively sold to Japanese tourists for a long time in, in Waikiki because it wasn't available in Japan. You could buy it here and take it home. And there were actually hawkers on the sidewalk in front of one of these stores that like, would grab Japanese men walking by and try to guide them in. So all of this is something that fortunately today, a lot of it has been eliminated, and Waikiki is actually better than it was. All right, yeah. look at this picture on the left of all the high rises. How, what, what guesses? When do you think that picture was taken? Last year, two years ago, how long? Well, you will probably be surprised to know that the picture was taken over 40 years ago. Oh. So Waikiki has been a mass of high rises for a very long time. So looking back and saying, oh, in the good old days, you know what, there are a lot of people who weren't even born in the time that you're talking about. So keep in mind, it's not, it didn't just happen. It's happened a long time ago. All right, now, finally, let's look at a special time in Waikiki 
which is World War II. Now, when World War II started on December 7th, 1941, uh, tourism was an important industry, but it was by no means the most important industry the way it is today, because at that time, sugar and pineapple industry were the two big uh, agricultural mainstays of the economy, and then the military spending was also very important. But tourism, when World War II started, was completely shut down. It was not possible to travel here purely for pleasure. The US Navy controlled all transportation, and it did not allow pleasure trips. So you could only come here if you were in the military, or you were coming here for a job that was probably connected to the military. All of the coastlines that were accessible in the Hawaiian Islands were lined by barbed wire, and that included Waikiki. So this is Waikiki during the war. And in the upper left corner, you see that's the Alawai Canal. We're looking at the Kalakaua Avenue Bridge. The Alawai Canal is also lined with barbed wire. So all of those tourists went away, but pretty soon there were huge numbers, even greater numbers of people in the military, mostly men, but some women as well. They more than took the place of tourists in terms of spending on souvenirs, services, liquor, food, etc. Waikiki absolutely packed with military people. Um, wandering around on the streets, going to Fort de Russy for their sort of uh, a transit point. That's the picture on the upper right. That building behind me is Malahia, which was a recreation building built during World War II. Um, all of the places that had food and drink, people lined up waiting to get in. That's the picture on the lower right corner outside a restaurant called Wagon Wheel. And Throughout the Hawaiian Islands, there were innumerable boys and some girls who shined shoes to earn money. So they were aggressively competing to shine the shoes of guys in the military. And that's what you see right there on Kalakaua Avenue next to the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. So the two main hotels, again, the Moana and the Royal Hawaiian, what did they do? Well, the Moana Hotel continued to function as a privately owned hotel. Of course, there again weren't any tourists coming here, but there were a lot of people passing through, as well as guys in the military who were able to spend the night at the hotel. So here is the Van Ann Court, obviously populated almost exclusively by people in the military, and that blue card is from early 1942, and it says that the person registered in room 103 is privileged to enter the blackout lounge. There was a very strict blackout every single night. Nothing, no lights could show outside. So to go in the blackout lounge, the room was entirely sealed probably by black fabric. Meaning, they could turn lights on, but there was absolutely no ventilation. So how attractive the blackout lounge I was, I could not tell you, not to mention you could not drink alcohol in there either. You probably could do stuff like read and play cards. Now the Royal Hawaiian had a very different experience. It was taken overseas, essentially, by the U.S. Navy within a certain amount, of, just days after the Pearl Harbor attack. And so the Navy turned it into a military rest and recreation location. And so civilians were kept out. It was fenced on the beach side with a barbed wire fence, meaning you couldn't just go in from the beach. And only military could stay there. They didn't take reservations. You had to just show up and say, do you have any rooms? Yes. They uh, put bunk beds in many of the rooms, so it's not like you were going into your own private suite. But it was still really nice. However, one of the things that a lot of onlookers said, oh my god, this is no longer a luxury hotel, is it? These guys would wash their underwear and their t-shirts and stuff and hang it up on the outside on their own So people said, no, we know it's not a resort hotel anymore. And here's the interior of the Royal Hawaiian, entirely populated by mostly Navy, and some Marine personnel were given priority because they had the most, uh, they were considered to have the most stressful military roles. But anybody in the military could stay there, and it cost like 25 or 50 cents a night, and as I said, that was a huge bargain compared to four to seven dollars a night, much less 45 dollars a night. Now, I always used to study World War II and think how fascinating it was, what a strange time it was, and 
wondered what it would have been like because I didn't live through it. And I was very curious, what would it be like to go through such a huge disruptive experience as that? Little did I know that one of them was about to sweep over me and everybody else. In January 6, 2020, this little article appeared in the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Mysterious pneumonia cases spread fear. Five possible cases have been found in Hong Kong that suspected at least 44 people in Wuhan, a city in China. Little did we know that within a short time, Waikiki was going to become a ghost town based on this. And it happened really fast. You may not remember how fast it was, because it was two years ago by now. But these two pictures were taken about 20 days apart. That's early March 2020 and late March 2020. And that is how fast Waikiki emptied out. So when I was worrying about or thinking about what would it be like to go through a disruptive event like World War II, now I was experiencing it. And what it meant was that the beach was empty. So people who lived here took advantage of being able to go in the ocean without millions of tourists being here, literally millions of tourists. And you were not allowed to sit or lie or lounge on the sand, but you could walk across it to go in to go swimming or surfing. So lots of people said, I'm going to go back to Waikiki because not only can I park, I can actually go in the ocean. And again, as I said, it was an astonishing, unbelievable experience to see Waikiki totally depopulated. And there it is, totally depopulated. Maybe you didn't go out of the house at that time, but that's what Waikiki looked like two years ago. Two years ago from Waikiki. And you may have read or seen stories about how animals kind of took back the streets in various places when the humans all went away. And it didn't quite happen as dramatically as it did in some other places, but this is the entrance to the Sheraton, which if you know it, is always packed with vehicles. And now it is entirely populated by ducks and pigeons. And right there in the word stop is a mother duck and her ducklings who have huddle down on the street because no one's going to interrupt them. It was also really unsettling, in a way, to see buildings that were literally boarded up for security purposes and because there wasn't anybody in them. Think about that. It's, it's unsettling. And at night, when you were in Waikiki, the main thing that you could hear in some places was the sound of the ocean, which is, when it happened to me, I couldn't believe it. All I heard, there were no cars, no people, just water. Unbelievable. And it really made you think about, okay, 100, 120 years ago, that's what it would have been like. Well, all of those buildings were also completely dark with nobody in them. And so the management of the hotels decided, well, we'll at least put some cheerful words on our buildings or symbols by turning on certain lights in certain rooms. So this is what Waikiki looked like with all of those buildings empty. And it was unbelievable to be able to stand literally in the middle of the street and to see no humans and no vehicles. And it was kind of exciting, but it was also actually scary because it was so bizarre. So you will all remember probably that right before this happened, there had been a lot of debate about, oh my god, too many tourists, too many tourists, what are we going to do? We don't want them. And then we got our wish. And we didn't have them. And they all went away. And so it's a double-edged sword to cut back on the number of people who come here. And that really, really brought it to the front for us to realize. So what is the solution? I have absolutely no idea. But that brings us to the end of this presentation.
presentation. 